Osseofiber Intelligent Bone Regeneration Technology is the first of its kind implant material. The material is stronger than cortical bone, used to securely fixate and fully integrate into the native anatomy with nothing left behind. Unlike other implants, osseofiber contains the same natural minerals that are found in bone themselves. It's however stronger and it eventually becomes part of the bone, encouraging a return to full strength naturally without the risks and costs associated with permanent hardware. Osseofiber offers surgeons and patients the confidence and certainty of a fully bio-integrative solution that utilizes existing reimbursement and surgical techniques and provides a more natural healing environment. Osseofiber has over 40,000 implantations in major segments of orthopedics such as foot and ankle, hand and wrist, and recently, pediatrics and sports medicine. Don't settle for metal. Osseofiber, a permanent solution without permanent implants. This week's episode of The Ortho Show is a special episode. We're sponsored by Osseo. We're bringing in the CMO, Greg Burlett, as well as one of the leading innovators uh, within the orthopedic industry, Nira Amin. We talk about the unique aspect of Osseo, which is this integrative screw. It's super cool. It actually turns into bone. You don't need metal. You don't have to settle for metal is their tagline which I love. So we talk about the uniqueness of this product, where it's going within the foot and ankle space and sports medicine in particular. It's really pretty cool. We're happy to be able to share it. Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is The Author Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund. Yes, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best. This is a special episode. We're going to be sponsored today by Osseo, which features implants that are made of the Osseo fiber. I absolutely love their tagline, don't settle for metal. We have two important guests on today. We're going to talk a little bit about biologics and orthopedics, and then talk a little bit more about to the special aspects of osseo in particular. So we've got Greg Burlett on, who's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, exceptionally well-known, specializes in foot and ankle. He's at the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Center in Columbus, Ohio. He is the chief medical officer of osseo, consultant for the uh, NHL Columbus Blue Jackets, and yes, for the, the Ohio State University. Greg, can I get a little O-H? O-H. I O. There you go. Perfect, brother. We love it. And then we have Nira Amin, who is an North Peak surgeon, dear friend of mine and colleague out in Southern California, who's a member of uh, Restore Orthopedics in Southern California, where he does adult knee reconstruction, as well as sports medicine. Nira, great to see you again, too, brother. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate the invite. All right. Terrific. So before we go do a deep dive in osseo, you know, let's talk a little bit about the revolution of things that are happening, you know, in orthopedics and healthcare. I like to say the first 20 years of my clinical practice, I was a mechanic, right? We had broken problems, whether it was a bone or a tendon, and we used anchors, we used screws, we used plates, and we mechanically fixed everything. And then really, you know, in the last 10 years, I've become much more of a biologist. We're incorporating other ways to try and get our body to figure out a way to heal itself. So, you know, so let's talk a little bit about that, Greg. What, what do you see? What have you seen about some biologic revelations that you're seeing in the world of foot and ankle at this time? Yeah, well, foot and ankles challenged uh, because a lot of our patient profiles are just not the healthiest. So we often have to trick them into healing uh, and just applying uh, implants uh, that are there exclusively to fix the bone and do nothing else uh, is really just not very interesting and it's not very effective. So we have gone towards implants that participate in the healing and that can be done with specialized metals uh, or it can be done with uh, biointegrative implants like we're talking about today. Fantastic. Nira, what about sports medicine? Because we got a lot of cool stuff within the biologic space of sports medicine that's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, Scott, I think it's become the new frontier. Um, as I call it, we've created a lot of widgets in the last 20 years, as you mentioned. In your career, you've probably seen an evolution of metal anchors to peak anchors to biocomposite materials. 
um, clearly we're down an evolution path of can we make biomaterial that has the ability to react and respond like metal, but has the ability to absorb like normal bone. And that's kind of the gap that we're missing in the shoulder space. And that's where we could potentially address a missing solution in that space. Yeah. And then there's implants, like there's collagen augmentation that's happening across a large space within foot and ankle, as well as in sports medicine. We've got the orthobiologics, which are currently right now autologous, where we have to take them out from the patient. But there is some science going on from big pharma and trying to come up with some great new ideas as well. But, you know, let's take a little dive now into osseo, Greg. You know, you're the chief medical officer. So what is it about osseo that that really makes it unique? The osseo fiber technology in particular, what is it that's going on there that makes it different? But if we tell a brief history lesson is I met Iran, who's really the brains and the science uh, behind osseo. I met him in 2017 in Toronto, and I was introduced to a technology without an application. And at the end of that meeting, I said, Iran, please, please let us apply this into the foot and ankle space because we are dying for something like this. So really what this is, is that sweetness, sweet spot of strength and then biointegration. Uh, Bioabsorbables kind of had their time in foot and ankle and then went away and we were left with a void there. Not uh, that we all needed to fill, we just didn't know how to. Osseo technology showed up uh, and then we were able to create uh, product manifestations of Osseo and it's really filled an important spot in our space. So what is it exactly, Greg? I mean, what are these fibers? What are they doing? Do they look like bone? I mean, what's it all about? Yeah, so it's a proprietary composition in microarchitecture with really natural mineral, minerals. The P, there is some uh, PLGL content in it that helps bind the minerals together, but the amount is very, very low. So if you've had any experience with previous bioresorbables, you sometimes would get this burst inflammation where it would look very inflammatory. And that's because of the pH uh, was being affected by the implant. That doesn't occur in osseo at all. It's a very slow controlled process. And then these minerals turn to bone. We have lots of clinical data that shows by 104 weeks, there's really nothing left behind except natural bone. I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years. And, and some of these bioabsorbable, you know, implants that were that we were using, literally two years later, you could take it out and you probably could have put it back into a box and shipped it out to somebody else. And if that didn't happen, you were left with this big gaping hole that was supposed to be where the bioabsorption was happening, but literally you were losing bone. So there was a lot of negative energy about those types of implants. I totally agree with you. Biointegrative is the tagline. Not bioresorbable, biointegrative. It'll integrate into the body. It's strong to do the job, and then it turns the bone. So it literally goes in as a fiber, as an implant. We're going to go to Nerev next, and then you you look back at it later on. You can't see this implant anymore. All you're doing is seeing bone. That's really really super cool. So Nerev, I mean, can can you can you take these fibers and like? You know, what do you do? Just squirt it into the hole? I mean, can you make it look like an implant? Can it look like a screw? Can it look like a staple? What do these things look like? Yeah, good, good question, Scott. I mean, I think in reality, I mean, the simplest way to describe it is it actually looks like a normal anchor or a screw or a staple or a typical implant that we use on a day-to-day -day base to do our fixation. So when you look at their lateral anchor, it essentially is an anchor that we've been using for years, except the difference is the material is also bio-integrated from all the way from the tip to the actual anchor body. The upside to it is because of the integration and the strength of the material, it almost behaves like a metal, but it is bio-integrative in its nature, so it goes away over time. So just think about it this way. I think when you do as much surgery as most of us probably do, uh, we're going to have failures. I think if you say to yourself, you don't have failures, I think you're lying to yourself or your patient's just going across the street. Um, so I think if you have, like as Greg, Greg alluded to, right, think about it, in two years, it's all gone. So if you do have to do a revision rotator cuff or revision surgery, you have native bone you're dealing with. So you're almost dealing with the fracture architecture of bone, which makes it really advantageous down the road. Compared to our historical days, right, where you do a metal screw or a peak anchor, and now you have to kind of work around those processes. 
So we'll talk about the revision side of things because I think that's really important. So, but when you're putting this thing in, you know, does it have the tactile feel of a screw or an anchor? You can feel it. You get the feedback to your hand, which goes to your brain. You says that's feeling really good as this thing goes in. Yeah, I mean, it's almost scary, Scott. Um, when you put the first threads in, I'm used to putting in anchors. By the time you try to try to turn the anchor, I, a typical uh, turn is like can't you just back, back, <laughs> right? Um, right. And then when you're too aggressive, there's like a little bit of concern or a caveat in that space. Um, and I think the reality is like with this anchor, you kind of get the picture, the count or the thread immediately at time zero. Awesome. So Greg, how long does it take for this bio integrative process to take place? When do we really see or expect to see this thing turn into bone? So at 104 weeks, which is two years, is that's how far we've taken out our animal clinical studies. Uh, we have studied this extensively, and I could go on for hours just talking about the data behind this. So we know that it is completely gone uh, by 104 weeks. Amazing. So, you know, one of the other things when I think of of bones, you know, we like to compress things, right? We want to make sure that the bone's going to heal. What's the sort of compressive strength of one of these screws? It, let's say if you're doing some sort of a, a, a fusion within the mid foot, for example, do you get really good force of compression like if you were using a metal screw? Uh, well, it's strong. So it's stronger than cortical bone. Uh, so this is a very robust implant. Uh, it comes in headed and, uh, and headless uh, variants. Uh, and so it feels very much uh, like you have. Now it's got some other advantages that you aren't intuitively obvious at first, but in the foot, prominence is a problem. And you can put in the screw, and if you put it obliquely and you don't like the tip, you can cut it, Scott. So you can trim the tip of that so it remains flush to the bone. Uh, if you put it in in that in that manner, uh, it is very unique. Uh, as Rev says, is there's a squeak when you put it in, and uh, as soon as I put it in somebody's hands, they invariably look at me and go, "All right, you got my attention now." You know, it's interesting. What what do we say in, in orthopedic surgery? What's the one operation that can really truly make you look bad? And that's hardware removal, right? So it seems to me like we might be able to skip that step moving forwards. I mean, that's the hope, right? Is uh, I call that the orthopedic annuity, hardware removal. If there's a couple of cases on every list. Um, I see the day coming where we're not gonna get paid for hardware removal. They're gonna say, look, that is an acknowledged complication. Uh, we're not paying you to take it out. Uh, so I believe the orthopedic annuity is going away. And I believe all of us are gonna be invested in the idea of avoiding hardware problems. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about the expanded indications outside of sports medicine and foot and ankle in particular, but that's where we're, where you guys are living now. So so Nir, give us some give us some cool sports medicine applications for these uh, osseo screws, staples, and anchors. Where where are you using it in clinical practice right now that you really think makes a difference for your patients? Yeah, Scott. So I use it in the rotator cuff setting overall. Um, I've also used it in uh, tibial tubercle osteotomies. I know Mike Freehill has done ladder J's with it, right? Instead of using metal screws where you have the fibrous uh, non-union or hardware complications, there's a broad base that is kind of taking place. People are using it in meniscal roots, for example, if you want to do meniscal roots or ACL fixation, backup fixation. One of the interesting aspects is a primary ACL reconstruction, then you use a bare technique or a MIOC. Right, so you use the ACL repair, you repair it primarily with an osseo. And if you think about it, a true biologic repair of the ACL is this, right? We put the ACL repair in, we actually tight line, nicely tie in, let's say it's a type two ACL proximal uh, femoral avulsion of the ACL, you put it back onto the wall and then you have a MEOC implant coming on top. So real big value add proposition in that space. So yeah, so rotator cuff repair surgery, uh, meniscal root repairs, you're talking about ACL repairs as well. You know, this is really sort of the bread and butter of the sports medicine with peak surgeon. And uh, there's all kinds of buttons and washers and other stuff that are out there. So it's really unique that uh, you could have an implant that you don't have to see on an x-ray and you know that's going to go away. So, so Greg, what's happening in foot and ankle? What are the cool things you're using it for? Well, of course, uh, we all want to be sports surgeons, so we're going to copy what you do. So uh, our uh, insertional Achilles tendinosis is analogous to your rotator cuff. Uh, and we do double row repairs of those now. 
and we use osseo anchors uh it's strong we can walk our patients right away we use anchors on lateral ligament reconstruction uh, we will use screws for bunion correction i do a lot of ankle arthroplasty and it's well accepted in our literature that if you have less than 11 millimeters of medial bone left after your ankle, you should support that. So I'll support that with osseo. You can't see it. The patient doesn't know it's there. It just supports and provides that biologic support. So let's talk a little bit about the part that you can't see, it, right? So again, you know, oftentimes we're in there, we're doing a corrective surgery, we're pushing things over. We want to know where things are going. We're all used to taking a KY or a pin or, you know, putting the screw in afterwards, and then we can see what we've done. How does it affect you as a surgeon within your technique to ensure that you're still going to get great positioning of your osteotomy or the surgery that you're doing? All right. So first, I will argue that I'm interested in the position of the bone, not what's holding it there, uh, because biologically, that uh, implant could potentially be taking up volume that should be used for bone healing. So if I put a couple screws across an osteotomy, the volume that's uh, taken up by that metal screw is no longer available for healing. It's quite different with the osseo implant. I'm achieving my fixation. My fixation is actually part of the biologic healing response. And then when I look at the foot, all I see is the osteotomy and the osteotomy healing. So in that bunion context, we call that technique the natural bunion. And, in, and patients uh, really respond well to that idea because uh, bunions are really a plastic surgery standard for the expectation. Uh, and, and they don't like the idea of metal when they're having something that's supposed to make them look more beautiful. And you, you brought it up. I mean, you're, you're not slowing their rehab down by using this material. You're allowing them weight bearing is tolerated in the usual fashion, the accelerated rehab that you would normally do. Yeah, there is no compromise on any level when I'm using osseo. The technique is the same. The time in the OR is, is the same. My post-op uh, recovery uh, protocols are the same. The only difference is that the patient satisfaction goes up considerably. All right. So, you know, we know that this isn't new, but give us an idea, Greg, as to how long this has been around, how many implants are put in, where are you with these days? Yeah. So uh, the idea was conceived in the, uh, or I was first presented in 2017. We came out of first products in 2019. We, uh, I successfully convinced Iran that we should really pilot this in foot and ankle. Uh, we're now over 40,000 implants. Uh, and uh, and going strong. The uh, adoption is very, very high once people get an opportunity uh, to feel it, touch it, use it. Awesome. So we're name droppers on the Ortho Show. You know, it's all about who you know and who you respect. So Nira, give us, give us some of your, the peeps that you respect and work with on a routine and regular basis, or at least that you have respect for across the country that are jumping on board and using OSEO. Yeah, good question, Scott. I mean, I think it's early in the process, right? Brandon Bryant's been doing a lot of TTOs with it. He's actually got really nice published literature. Um, in his TTOs over the last three years, he had a 42% return to OR to remove the screws from the TTOs. Um, in the osseo group, he has not had any malunions or non-unions to date. Freehill has been doing some nice work on the latter J side early on um, in that aspect. I think the lateral row anchor, I'd be fair and remiss to tell you, it's um, it's growing in the market. Um, I think once you use it, the ability to kind of switch over to the other anchors um, is hard to do just because of the fixation and the pullout strength that you get. Uh, but I, I think they're, they're slowly evolving into the sports space. Um, Sean Kelly, uh, Ryan Ackerman, and another group of uh, really uh, renowned surgeons are starting to kind of navigate into it. I, Ryan Ackerman's uh, part of a study called the knee bar study that they're publishing as well, looking at or insufficiency fractures of the tibial plateau and the femoral condyle and looking at the return to re, um, return to function rate. And they have a really nice score in the setting uh, led by a couple of prominent surgeons. So there's kind of a value add proposition that's really taking place in this setting. I think we got another Sean in there too. Sean McMillan, we got to give him a shout out to. He's been yeah. doing a bunch of these as well. Yeah. Don't forget about Sean. He's over in New Jersey. Come on. I you know. <laughs> He's he's always working, so he's he's probably the using the most overall. Yeah, he's Sean's all. everywhere for sure. So, Greg, what about the foot and ankle space? Give us some big names that are out there using your product. 
Yeah, well, the interesting thing, so I've had the opportunity to chair two courses over the last few weeks. One was called the Foot Innovate Leadership, one in Dallas. The other one was a Striker Total Ankle this past weekend in San Francisco. Uh, and the conversation around Osseo happens spontaneously. There's no, there's no uh, feed uh, from the podium. It just is incorporating in. And so, uh, you know, all of the top fellowships in the country, HSS, Charlotte, Duke, us, uh, that's, it's penetrated into everybody. So the big trick is now is the creativity and people are finding their way to it. Yeah. What, what's the, what's the one thing that an orthopedic surgeon does well, give them a new operation. The first thing they do is they make it their own. Right. And then, uh, people are quite imaginative as to the things that they can do as well. I think the latter J for me, I do distal tibial allograft, so it's really interesting. You can certainly get some pain from those hardware, and removing those screws can really be quite challenging in and of itself. So that's a great uh, potential for technique as well. So, so Greg, I mean, can are we going to see some of the bigger, bigger type of implants? You know, more getting into the trauma world and some other things that might be coming down the pipeline. Right. Uh, so there is lots of pipeline, and we have a two-year data on a plating study. Uh, and remember, we're a startup. Uh, so when taking this uh, from uh, design paper into production and then commercialization, uh, you just have to do it very deliberately. And, and our leadership is very, very careful about that uh, and, uh, and understanding it. So yes, you can do pretty much anything in orthopedics with this implant that you can dream up. So if you tell me that you've got a screw and you need a little extra strength, at the uh, shaft thread interface, uh, you can lay down a triple helix there and reinforce it. If you tell me you need the corners of your staple to be a little uh, stiffer for this and that reason, uh, we can do it. So uh, this is a platform technology. It's not a single device uh, and it will continue to expand as such. Uh, but you know, it's a it's a team that's interested in quality. It's a team that's really interested in, in doing the right thing. Uh, and when you're that careful of a steward of your technology, it just takes a bit of time. That's awesome. So, you know, we, we get a lot of pressure these days on, on reimbursement and cost, right, guys? And ASC, 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 that's where we're all going. So, Nirav, I mean, how, how are we doing on cost comparable to other products? Are we reasonable? Is this something that we can expect that people can use? Yeah, Scott, um, I think the team is very cognizant of the cost uh, parameters of it. I, I think they navigate with you in that setting and allow you to be within cost neutral uh, settings. Uh, look, at the end of the day, if you're talking about a difference of five, ten dollars and you're conscientious of that difference, it's hard to be in that realm. But if we're not talking about a hundred dollars or we're not talking about several hundred dollars of a difference on an implant setting. So the team is very elegant in nature. Greg said it the best, right? They're very methodical. They're very careful in the applications is our technology play. It's not isolated to a lateral anchor or to a screw or to a nail. It's got broad band width. I think the reality is, is finding the clinical value at first going into that space and then kind of navigating to a broader base as time moves on. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems like a natural transition for you guys. I mean, I know Yvonne Tornos is listening to every episode, Leslie Storms, Aldo Dente, you know, Greg, you know, Greg, you've had some relationships with Stryker as well. I mean, it seems like this will be a natural transition, hopefully that, uh, you know, that will be a part of where you guys go here in the future. But, you know, what I see really amazing, you know, things for Osseo in particular is I think our orthopedic world is really moving into more biologic healing, being able to convince the body to heal itself by providing the tools that it needs. And I think this is truly innovative technology. Uh, the idea that tr that an implant will truly integrate into the bone rather than what we've seen in the past. So, you know, congratulations to the two of you, Greg. I think, you know, as a CMO of the company, you guys are doing a great job, Nirav. You're clearly one of the key opinion leaders. Uh, you usually have amazing ideas and concepts that you typically share with the rest of us. So congrats to the two of you. We really appreciate your time today and being able to share the story of Osseo. Thanks, Scott. To put an exclamation point on what you said, I write osseo into my consent because I want the patients to ask me, what is it? Why are you using it? And this is when I can stand behind all day. Fantastic. Nero, closing comments? Hey, Scott, I've been fortunate to be part of this journey early on. And I think in the sports medicine space, we've been yearning for something that has biology 
with the strength of metal is the simplest way I can do it. I'm not as smart as you are. You've got that picture of yourself in the middle and the guy to the right, Albert Einstein. You look pretty similar in intelligence. So, uh, but on my end, right, for me, simple is simple is the best way. If we can incorporate biology with the strength of metal, we've kind of hit the holy grail of medicine. And this is walking down that pathway. So I'm fortunate enough to be with the team and fortunate to be a part of Greg's team and kind of moving in that direction. Yeah, we're super proud at the Ortho Show to be able to provide our listeners uh, a, a view of the latest technologies that are happening within the orthopedic space. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.